Chapter 7 of The Boy Scouts on Lost Trail by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A Day in Camp. The sun had been above the treetops an hour when Upton awoke and routed out his three companions. Pat was gone, so was Spud's rifle, and the four lone wolves grinned as they noted the fact. Bet he's out after a deer, said Spud. With a twenty-two rifle, guess again, retorted Hal. He's after those moccasins, said Plimpton, though what he's going to make em of is beyond me, unless it's rabbit skins. If it was, he'd have kept those we had last night, but he didn't, said Upton. Anyway, let's have breakfast ready when he gets back. Spud, the ground's too cold for you to be fooling around on it with nothing but socks on your feet. You're relieved from all duty this morning. Spud protested, but he was overruled on the ground that the expedition could afford to take no more chances of having him laid up permanently. The fire was going, the bacon sputtering cheerfully, and Walter was preparing to toss flapjacks when the crack of a rifle was heard at no great distance from camp, followed a few minutes later by a second shot, and then two more. Five minutes later, Pat stalked into camp from back of the lean-to and dropped a pair of moccasins in front of the astonished Spud, who gaped at them with his jaw dropped foolishly. The others looked scarcely less foolish. "'Twas good luck I was after having this morning, though it took four shots to get them. Sure the smell of bacon is teasing my stomach till I can't stand it another minute. What ails the likes of yous? Pat had spoken in a matter-of-fact tone imaginable at first, and he ended with such a look of innocent surprise as he appeared to notice for the first time the four vacant faces staring at him that he was irresistible, and all shouted with laughter. "'Say, you great son of St. Patrick, what kind of steer are you trying to put over on us anyway?' howled Hal, hurling one of Spud's shoes at Pat. Pat deftly ducked, and his look of surprise gave way to one of outraged innocence. "'Sure tis a nice reception I do be havin'. I may take him the trouble of breaking me night's rest to shoot a pair of moccasins to save this expedition from failure,' he grumbled. Meanwhile, Spud had been examining the moccasins. He looked at Pat now with sudden suspicion born of a discovery he had made. "'Quit your foolin', Pat, and tell us where you got these,' he snapped. "'They're mine.' "'Sure, they're yours. Didn't I go to shoot them for you?' replied Pat. "'I mean, they're my old ones, the ones I wore at Woodcraft. Did you have them with you all the time? I believe you did.' Spud was busily putting them on. Pat laughed, a big, hearty laugh that was good to hear. "'Tis a good little guesser you be, and I do be having hopes that we'll be making a real scout of you one of these days,' said he. "'Mayhap you will remember that a good scout is always prepared, and so I took the liberty of pinching the moccasins when you was packing up at Woodcraft, for I knew the evil eye had been cast upon them boots. I have guided the likes of them in the woods too often not to know what was going to happen.' "'so I put the moccasins in me pack. "'Now will we be after having a bite to eat? "'Me stomach, wait a minute. "'What were you shooting at?' interrupted Walter. "'Pat stepped back of the lean-to and picked up four grouse, "'neatly decapitated by a single shot. "'Tis a little contribution to the joy of eating,' "'he announced as he dropped them at one side of the fire. "'Breakfast out of the way, "'it was decided to spend the day hunting, fishing, "'and exploring the surrounding country.' Al and Plimpton elected to go fishing. Spud wisely decided to remain in camp to give his feet a rest, and offered his rifle to Walter, who gladly accepted it and started out with Pat in the quest of more grouse and rabbits. "'Good luck to you,' shouted Spud. "'And, oh, Pat, while you're about it, you might bring us in a deer. A taste of fresh venison would cure my feet.' Pat had told Hal that he would find the best fishing on the far side of the pond near the entrance to a small cove and that he would probably find an old raft moored there. He advised taking along some bacon rind for skittering, gravely asserting that every pickle in the pond be a whale. As Hal had had no luck from the shore the night before, he and Plimpton decided that they would try the cove. They found a rough trail skirting the shore and in due time found the raft. It was waterlogged and hardly big enough for two, but they decided that by adding a few small logs it could be made to do. With the aid of their belt axes, these were soon secured and added to the raft. 
Then a couple of long poles were cut to pole it about in shallow water, and with a couple of saplings for rods they were, as Hal expressed it, ready to go a-whaling. Cautiously poling out, in about seven feet of water they prepared to try their luck. For a while they skittered in vain. Then, as Plimpton jumped his piece of bacon rind just beyond a patch of pondweed, there was a sudden lunge, and he was fast to a big one. Without a reel there was no chance of playing the fish, which, with a light rod in his hands, is a joy of the fisherman. It was simply a case of strength of line and rod against the strength and weight of the fish, with the advantage all in favor of the former. Plimpton simply swung the end of the rod around until Hal could get a hold of the line, and a minute later a five-pound pickerel lay on the raft with his spinal cord severed by a cut just back of the head. Presently Hal caught a smaller one, and then Plimpton caught one of about the same size. It was hardly to be called sport in the accepted sense of the word, but it was fun just the same, for on the precarious footing afforded by the overloaded old raft there was excitement enough and to spare. Besides, as Plimpton reminded Hal, they were fishing for grub and not just for the fun of catching fish. For a while there were no more strikes, and Hal grew impatient. There's a big patch of lily pads over there, and I have a hunch that one of Pat's whales is waiting for us, said he. Do you suppose we can make it? By dint of careful poling and some hand paddling when the water became too deep to use the poles, they got within casting distance of the pads, and Hal stood up for the first cast. The bait had hardly hit the water when it was seized by a rush that made the water boil. Hal struck quick and hard. I've got him! What did I tell you? He's a whale! A regular old granddaddy whale! He yelled as a fish made a lunge that threatened to yank the pole out of his hands. Quick, sister! Get hold of that line! Alas for the shortness of human memory! In his excitement, Hal forgot where he was and stepped backward to bring the line within reach of Plimpton's outstretched hand. A loose log rolled under his foot, and with a mighty splash, Hal went overboard. Nor was this all. Relieved of Hal's weight, the raft abruptly tilted in the opposite direction, and Plimpton, already almost off his balance in his anxiety to reach the line, took a header with neatness and dispatch. Fortunately, both were good swimmers, and it was the work of but a few minutes to scramble back on the raft where they sat grinning at each other in idiotic fashion. Phew, gasped Plimpton when he could get his breath. That water's cold, and the air's colder, spluttered Hal, his teeth beginning to chatter. We've got to get a hump on ourselves and get back to camp before we get our deaths. And we didn't get that fish to show for it. And he was a regular old sock dollager, he ended with a wail. There was a heavy splash behind him, and Plimpton made a sudden grab that came within an ace of dumping them both in the water again. "'He's fast yet!' he yelled. "'Quick, Hal! The line's caught around the end of that log. But it'll be off in a minute!' Sure enough, the line was fast. It had caught with half a turn around the end of one of the logs of the raft when Hal had dropped his rod in a sudden plunge overboard. And now the big fish was splashing and lunging in a way that threatened to tear the hook loose if it didn't jerk the line free. Hal clutched at it frantically, and he was none too soon, for even as his fingers closed on it, it slipped off the log. Hand over hand the big fish was pulled in until they could look into its great gaping mouth with its myriad wicked-looking teeth. The bait had been swallowed and the hook was fast in his gullet, or he would have torn loose before this. Very gingerly, for he had no mind to have his hand torn by those vicious teeth, Plimpton reached down and slipped his fingers into the gills. Then, with a quick yank, he landed the prize on the raft, where he was speedily put out of misery, and also all chances of escape, by a knife thrust through the spinal column. Whoopee! yelled Hal. He'll go ten pounds if he'll go an ounce. Isn't he a beaut? Now it's us for sure and a good big fire. <laughs> We'll freeze to death if we don't hustle. But it's worth it, eh, sister? You bet, grinned Plimpton, his teeth chattering in spite of his efforts to prevent them. The exercise of paddling and poling warmed them up a little, and shore was reached without further mishap. Then, with the fish strung on a stout stick between them, they started for camp at the best pace the rough going would permit. It was a little past noon when they reached there, and they found Spud making preparations for dinner. He heard them coming, and without looking up from his task, growled, "'Hurry up, you fellows. I suppose you've got some fish.' 
We need them, for somehow there doesn't seem to be any too much bacon. I thought we had four slabs, and I can't find but one besides the one we've cut into. A pretty kind of commissary you are, Hal, to stock us short on the only meat we're sure of. Then he looked up, and for a full minute stared at the fish, and then at the bedraggled figures. "'Jerusalem crickets!' he gasped. "'Do you have to go in swimming after a fish in this country? "'Because if you do, little Spud is going to stick the rabbits. "'That's a rip-snorter of a pickerel, all right. "'And by the look of you, I bet he dragged you all over the pond. "'Some fisherman you are.' Then, noticing for the first time that they were shivering, for at that altitude September winds are not exactly balmy, Spud forgot sarcasm in his desire to do something for their comfort. He had not forgotten their consideration of him the night before. Strip off those duds and wrap up in blankets. You can be heap big engines while I get a fire going to dry out things. Spud spoke with an air of command. Hal began to say something about dressing the fish, but Spud cut him short. Cut it! "'Cut it!' he snapped. "'I was left in charge of this camp, and you take orders from me, see? "'Off of those duds now!' He soon had a good fire going, and improvising a clothesline from a coil of rope, hung the wet garments to dry. The moccasins he stuffed with dry grass and put them out where the sun and air would have a chance at them. Plimpton noticed this and nudged Al. "'Remember the time you hung your moccasins to dry by the fire and they burst all the stitches?' he murmured. "'Shall I ever forget it?' replied Hal, laughing. "'Spud's got the subject of feet very much on his mind just now "'and doesn't intend to let the rest of us get in trouble with footgear. "'It will take time to dry them out that way, "'but it's the only way if we want to keep them reasonably soft.' "'With dry underwear and stockings and wrapped in their blankets, "'Hal and Plimpton were soon squatting in comfort before the fire, "'while at a little cooking fire off to one side, "'Spud was preparing to fry the smaller fish.' for which purpose he had cut them in convenient pieces. "'How about the whale? When do we get him?' Hal called. "'Tonight. Baked a la Spud Eli,' replied the cook, deftly turning the pan biscuit that were to accompany the fish. Pat and Upton now put in their appearance, one rabbit being their sole contribution to the larder as a result of their morning hunt. Of course they instantly demanded the cause of the camp's wash-day appearance, and long and hearty was the laugh as Plimpton drolly described the whaling trip, and drew a graphic word-picture of the catastrophe. Pat fairly hugged himself in delight. "'Mr. Leader, I move that a complete account of the catching of the whale be ordered written in the official report of this expedition,' said he. "'No, you don't,' shouted Hal. "'Not unless an account of Spud's getting lost goes too.' protested Plimpton. It was Spud's turn to howl now, and he did it long and loud. "'What do you fellows think the big chief will think of me if he hears about that?' he wailed. "'A fine kind of scout he'll say I am, I don't think. I move that the records contain only a count of the trail in the county we pass through.' "'Hear, hear!' shouted Hal and Plimpton. "'Put it to a vote, Mr. Leader. This is a matter for the commanding officer to decide, and not for a vote by the patrol.' announced Walter. It is herewith ordered that Scout Plimpton make a complete and detailed report of all events, haps, mishaps, and doings of the lone wolves day by day, and this order is irrevocable. You wait, humbled Spud. You just wait. We'll get something on you yet, and then you'll wish you hadn't. The lusciously brown fish and the hot biscuit were soon disposed of. It was while the dishes were being washed that Hal suddenly remembered Spud's remark as he and Plimpton had approached with the fish. "'By the way, Spud,' he called, "'what were those reflections you were casting on my abilities as commissary?' "'I said, or I meant to say, that it is a darn poor commissary that stocks an expedition short on supplies, and we're short on bacon, if I know anything about it,' retorted Spud. "'No such thing,' Hal spoke with some heat. I ordered, bought, and paid for four slabs of bacon and saw it packed. And that ought to be enough for two weeks. You better use your eyes before you go knocking others. That's just what I did do, till they ached. And you've got to put on a pair of double compound magnifying glasses and see double if you find more than one slab besides the one we've been cutting from, retorted Spud. The heated discussion drew the others, and the situation was quickly explained. Hell's right asserted Walter. I checked up with the supplies myself, and there were four slabs of bacon, 
Probably the missing ones have been misplaced, and Spud overran the trail. This sly thrust at Spud produced a grin from all but the astute young man. All right, he growled. Show me the bacon, and I'll eat humble pie for the rest of this trip. At once all hands but the disgruntled Spud joined in a general overhauling of the supplies and then a thorough search of the camp, even to the emptying of the individual packs, but without result. What did I tell you? Spud grinned maliciously. Overran the trail, did I? Well, there are others. But that bacon was here this morning when I cooked breakfast, for I saw it, insisted Walter. If anyone's trying to put across a joke, it's time to call it off right now, he added. But each in turn protested that he knew nothing about the missing meat. This is serious, said Walter. If supplies are going to walk off of their own accord right under our noses, it's time we got busy and put a stop to it. What did you do while they were away from camp, Spud? Took it easy in the lean-to per orders until it was time to start things for dinner, replied Spud promptly. Didn't leave camp at all? No. Sleep? Spud flashed slightly. Well, maybe I dozed off, but not more than half an hour, he confessed, and then added defensively. I didn't know I was supposed to be doing guard duty. That's right, Spud, you weren't supposed to be on guard because I didn't suppose a guard was needed way off up here. I'd have taken a nap if I had been in your place. Had any visitors? Nope. Then, fellows, it's clear to me that that bacon walked, ran, or flew away while Spud was asleep, and the thing for us to do is to find out how. What is your opinion, Corporal? Walter turned to Pat. That some varmint has sneaked out of the woods and helped himself. Though what it may be, I don't know at all at all, unless it be a bear, and the boldest of them would hardly be walking in the camp in broad daylight at this season of the year. A fool porcupine might do it for the love of the salt, but if he did, he would be leaving a trail easy to follow. I'll take a bit of a look about for tracks. A careful scrutiny of the ground in the immediate vicinity of the camp failed to reveal any tracks save of a venturesome mink, and these, Pat asserted, were made in the night, for he had noticed them when he got up at daylight, nor were there any evidences that the meat had been dragged over the ground. It was a mystery for which there seemed to be no explanation. While the others had been hunting for tracks, Spud had quietly checked up supplies. When he had finished his inventory, he hailed Walter. Mr. Leader, he called, have you got the original list of supplies? No, replied Upton. I returned it to the commissary. Why? Looks to me as if a piece of salt pork had gone with the bacon. I was going to suggest that we check off with the original list and make allowances for what we have eaten, said Spud. Good idea. Al, dig out that list of supplies and check off with Spud, ordered Upton. This was done, Hal calling off and Spud checking on his list. Beyond the bacon, things tallied until Hal read three packages of crackers. Two, reported Spud. Sure of that? asked Walter sharply. Count them yourself, it isn't difficult, replied Spud, pointing to the two boxes. Eight packages of raisins, read Hal. Six here. "'And one we ate yesterday,' reported Spud. "'The others now crowded close to look over the shoulders of the two checkers "'as if to make sure that no error was made. "'When the checking was finished, it showed that in addition to the missing bacon, "'crackers, and raisins, a piece of pork and a quantity of evaporated apricots had also vanished. "'The lone wolves looked at each other blankly. "'What kind of critter would eat apricots and raisins?' asked Plimpton slowly. "'A two-legged one!' There be varmints and varmints, and the worst kind walks on two legs. But I didn't dream that there was any of that kind in these woods, said Pat promptly. Tis tracks without claws that we do be best looking for now, Mr. Later. We'd best look after our personal stuff and see if any of that be gone. A hasty inventory of equipment showed nothing missing, much to their relief. Then Walter issued orders. Hal and Plimpton were to remain in camp until their clothes and moccasins were thoroughly dry. He himself, Pat, and Spud would scout around the little clearing for signs. Under no conditions was the camp to be left unguarded for a minute. There was some grumbling on the part of the unlucky fishermen, who were anxious to share in the excitement of the hunt. But there was no help for it, and they were forced to make the best of the situation. The others agreed that each should take a third section of an imaginary circle of which the camp was the center, and figuratively speaking, scrape it with a fine-toothed comb. 
when he had covered his assigned territory, if nothing had been discovered, each was to take the next adjacent section. Thus the entire circle would be covered three times. An hour's patient search revealed nothing, and each had started in on his third section. This brought Spud along to the edge of the pond where Hal and Plimpton had taken the trail to the cove that morning. Their tracks, both going and coming, were plain to see, and hardly gave them a passing glance. He had started to cut across the trail and work his way up into the woods as Walter and Pat had already done, when a sudden impulse led him to turn aside and follow the cove trail for a short distance, studying the footprints where they were visible in the soft earth, which in places was little more than swamp muck. Now with all his fun-loving, easy-going disposition, Spud possessed one trait for which he was not always given the credit deserved. This was a bulldog tenacity of purpose. Once he had set his mind to do a thing, he hung on until the thing was done or he had proved it to his own satisfaction that he couldn't do it. The trouble with Spud was that he seldom set his mind to anything, and so was careless and not often taken seriously. The problem with him was to thoroughly arouse his interest. In the present instance it was aroused. He had felt more keenly than the others realized his carelessness in overrunning the trail the day before. He also blamed himself, though the others did not, for sleeping that morning and thus giving the thief a chance. He wanted to prove to his companions, but to himself more, that he was not so poor a scout as he appeared, and so he had thrown himself into his search for signs of the thief with all the powers of concentration he possessed. Almost automatically he noted the difference in the length of the strides in the outgoing and incoming trails of the two fishermen. In some hurry getting back to camp, he chuckled, hmm. "'Somebody was off stride here,' he continued, talking to himself. "'That print falls right in the middle of Hal's stride, and... "'Say, it looks to me as if there had been three people along here. "'Wonder if Pat was over here this morning.' "'He frowned down at the puzzling trail, then broke a stick from a sapling "'and carefully measured a print he knew to be Hal's, and then the odd one. "'The latter was a quarter of an inch longer. "'It wasn't Plimpton's, because the ladders were considerably shorter.' It didn't seem big enough for one of Pat's, but to make sure he retraced his steps to a point where he had noticed a fresh print left by Pat at the water's edge when he had covered that section. I thought so, he muttered. Now we'll see, Mr. Thief, if you went back the way you came. He returned to the trail to the cove and followed it far enough to be convinced that the strange prints all headed toward the camp, and none returned. At one place he found a particularly clear print where the ground was sandy rather than muddy. This he studied with care. That settles it, he exclaimed triumphantly. That fellow had a patch on the sole of his right moccasin. Now I guess I'm ready to report. He found the others at camp and knew by the glum looks that they had found nothing. At first they were inclined to think that Spud had allowed his imagination to run away with him but when he led Walter and Pat to the trail and pointed out the prints, they were forced to believe. "'The boy is right,' said Pat. "'The varmint came this way, but he didn't return, and that means that he went some other way, Mr. Leader. "'If you'll say the word, I'll be taking a look along the trail we came in by yesterday, and it may be that I will find something.' Of course the word was said, and Pat set out on the back trail where the others discussed the day's events and wondered if they would receive another visit from the thief and who he could be. In about an hour Pat returned, and they knew by his broad smile that he had news. The trail was too dry to show prints, but half a mile back I found cracker crumbs where the bloody thief had had lunch, he announced. "'Tis clear in my mind now. A bit beyond the cove there was a trail over to the Gillicuddy lumber camp some ten miles to the east. A thieving lumberjack without sense of honor happened along on his way out this morning and helped himself. Or maybe twas a hunter, bad cess to him. Anyway, he hit the trail, and we'll see no more of him. This seemed a logical explanation of the mystery, and the subject was dropped, though not until Spud had been given due credit for his clever work. Mr. Leader, does that go in the records? he asked gravely. It sure does, and I hereby give the order, declared Walter, while all hands grinned. End of chapter 7